What's up, everyone? Here I am with an unfortunate special edition of the Aubrey Marcus podcast and uh, a Facebook Live talking about the Las Vegas tragedy. And the first thing I wanted to do, which clearly I'm already doing, is connect with really what happened there. It's easy to get caught up in statistics and numbers and news and not actually recognize the human tragedy, the human loss, and the heroism that took place. And, you know, just imagine those people as you living a different life. We've all gone to concerts. We've all been in Las Vegas. Most of us have. Wherever we've been, we've been in a situation like that where we go to relax, have fun, have a couple beers, put in a snooze, you know, hang out, laugh with our friends, smoke a little weed, listen to Jason Aldean. I mean, this is like, this is life, you know? This is what we've worked for, what we've built for. And then to have that turn into something that's straight a nightmare, you know? Bullets raining from the sky, you know, your family there. And then to hear the stories of people's reactions, who's ever prepared for that? How do you practice for that? But nonetheless, people diving on top of other people, people risking their life to save others, just ordinary individuals, you know, doing that. Um, but not everybody made it, you know? And so taking a moment to connect with those people and realizing that that could be you, that could be someone you love, It doesn't need to be that way. It doesn't need to happen. And there will always be outliers. There will always be things. But this is becoming increasingly too common. And I know that everybody wants to talk about guns. And I suppose at the end we can talk about that. But that's not the point of this. The point is the urge to violence. What's causing people to want to hurt others and hurt themselves? What makes them feel like human life is not worth living? And that they want to destroy not only themselves but life itself. How much pain is that person in that they're willing to do that? That's the question that I really want to discuss here and discuss what we can do to help mitigate that. <sighs> so now, since we've connected, I think the first step, you know, is compassion. And that is the first step. That's what's missing here. You know, compassion is the step that was missing in the shooter, compassion for himself, compassion for others. And I think if we're going to solve this, we have to connect with compassion. But we can't live just in compassion. We can't just live in, you know, in our homes and just watch it and feel some compassion and then move on and brush it aside because it's too hard. We have to use that compassion as fuel to drive action. And that's, you know, that's the point of, of this chat here and this podcast and this Facebook Live. Um, so everybody knows uh, you can start asking questions at any time. I have my team here, um, full team. I'll go turn the camera around to show everybody full team here to access and answer questions. Uh, also, anybody who leaves a comment, um, we're going to be replying to your comments and uh, giving you access to um, a charity campaign that I've launched that we'll talk about more as this develops. So anybody who wants to leave a comment, you can just put hi or a thumbs up or whatever you'll make sure that you get the link when this follows up. So um, I'll show you the team that we got in place. It's Caitlin, CT, Ryan, Lizzie, Kyle, Sarah, Vince, Stephanie. They're all here to uh, help support this. Because um, nothing that happens here happens alone. So, and this will take a, take a village to, to address and to fix. Uh, so, all right. Um, Let's get it started. So now let's take our compassion hat off because it's hard to even talk when we have that in fucking full, full steam. And let's, uh, let's talk about what we can do here. You know, um, so here's what we know for sure. You know, there's not a lot of information coming out about this guy, but what we do know is that as a society, as a whole, we're not good at preventing people from breaking and we're not good at fixing broken people. And clearly, you know, something was broken inside this man. I mean, that impulse to violence is, you know, has no 
biological advantage. He's killing himself. You know, this is clearly a broken program. You know, there's no program running that makes sense. This is something that happened to the human operating system that created that. That's something we know. So let's just go over the potential random things that may have happened, not random, but the potential connected things that may have happened. So for the first for the first thing, you know, undoubtedly we have a shitty mental health system. And that is something that I've had personal experience with. And um, I've been reticent to talk about this much on any podcast or anything, but um, someone in my close family, um, you know, started suffering from schizophrenic psychosis. And uh, I've been involved in opening the door to that house and letting the SWAT team in to go tase him, arrest him, and take him to the mental hospital uh, on two occasions because um, other members of my family felt unsafe. And I've had to confront an individual in that state of psychosis who was close to me. And I won't say any more about who it is, but, um, and I've seen how the mental health system works. And they take him in for a few days, they put him on some meds, they make sure he takes the meds. He gets a little bit better. Good enough to convince them to release him. And then immediately he gets off the meds and he's back to the same. Now, there is nothing else that can be done. If, he, if someone's able to play the game, someone's able to pass by as okay, to hide their characteristics as, you know, in form of self-defense so they don't get, you know, directly flagged. If they can just barely keep it together, there's no action. There's no follow-up. You know, the neighbors are calling me saying he's doing crazy things in the street. And I say, look, I, I fucking let the SWAT team in twice. Like, I can't. I can't do anymore. He's, you know, he's not going to let me in the house. You know, he grabbed a golf club last time I showed up and, you know, it's, it's, it's a fucked situation because there's no follow up and there's no community that actually outreaches for this. There's just very black and white laws about what can be done and what, you know, what the legal system can do. And I don't have a solution for that, but you know, I know that that's a problem because I've seen it firsthand. So, a shitty mental health system. Now, obviously, if this guy had been committed already, you know, probably we would know it. Um, but nonetheless, that's a problem that could contribute uh, could contribute to this. And really, you know, if, if people have suggestions in the comments, or you know, some people know more about this than me. You know, this is happening in the state of Texas. Probably states have different laws, but it's um, unless there's a direct credible threat to another person's harm, or they can, there's really just nothing that the police. Can can do um so that's one thing we got to improve our mental health system the other thing is there are really poor mental health protocols so this is something that you know rogan talks about a lot and i was able to pull up an article from dr hyla cass and for those of you listening um lizzie's going to be supplying the links to uh to some of these studies and in different opinion pieces but she's a um She's a doctor with some experience, and she wrote an article for Huffington Post a few years ago, and the article's titled, Is It Drugs, Not Guns? Um, let me just get the full title here. Is it drugs? Not, what's the full title, Lizzie? Is it drugs, not guns, Is it drugs, not guns that cause violence? Um, so, and that's a really interesting article, and in that article, she cites, uh, this is a quote from her, she says, Fluoxetine, Prozac, the first well-known SSRI antidepressant, Prozac, is 10.9 times more likely to be linked with violence in comparison with other medications. 10.9 times more likely to be linked with violence with people on Prozac. The next one is particularly scary since it's for smoking cessation, a seemingly good trade-off until you read the stats. The anti-smoking medication, Varenicline, which is marketed as Chantix, affects the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, which helps reduce craving for smoking. Unfortunately, it's 18 times more likely to be linked with violence compared to other drugs. By comparison, that number is 3.9 and 1.9 for nicotine replacement. Um, that's crazy. 18 times more likely to lead to violence with Chantix. 10.9 times more likely to lead to violence with Prozac. And if you watched Prescription Thugs, which is a great documentary by Chris Bell, he tells a, a tragic story of a college student who was, you know, 
kind of seemed like she was having the blues and she goes to her um she goes to the the doctor and they prescribe a bunch of antidepressants and fast forward a few months and she was you know the family thought all right she's just you know kind of in a bum stretch get on some meds and they'll help her out she dumps gasoline on herself and lights herself on fire like that is really aberrant behavior the violence associated with it the pain associated with it that's not what this not in the characteristic of that human being when you start messing with the brain's neurochemistry there can be side effects and especially messing with it in this particular way um and i think that's something that we got to look at now is that for sure the cause of course not we don't know but that's something that we really have to pay attention to and i think it's worth highlighting and it's something that is distinctly absent from the news everybody's talking motive 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 like what's his what's his drug history like what's his what are his prescriptions what is he on like if you have studies and, and there's a study that um that Lizzie will link that has a list of all the drugs and their uh, the increased rates of violence associated with them. Lizzie, if you drop that one in there, so you know you can look at that chart. You have to address it, but the media is not addressing it now. Dr. Hyla Cass says that that might be you know she suggests that might be because of the influence of the pharmaceutical um, big pharma on the media. You know, obviously this is not a good story. This is big billion dollar business. Maybe that's maybe that's a factor. You know, shit, how many times are you watching TV and you see a, a pharmaceutical ad? You know, a lot. That's a lot of money they're spending. And so, you know, unfortunately, you can't overlook the influence that money might have in, in you know, convincing the media not to really pursue these, um, these lines of investigation. But you got to look there, especially with this guy. Like, you're not finding any other motive. He's not a religious extremist. He's not... You know, there's nothing else there that goes. It's like the college student from Prescription Thugs who lit herself on fire. Like, this is aberrant. Like, his brother was like, what the fuck? It was like he was quoted saying it was like a meteor hit. Like, he had no idea. So you got to look there, man. You like, you got to look there. And I want to contrast, um, especially with that, that study on uh, Chantix, which says it's 18 times more likely to be linked with violence. Contrast that with a study done by Johns Hopkins on psilocybin, which has none of those side effects. In fact, the opposite. And they found that the abstinence, the abstinence rate for study participants in a smoking cessation trial with psilocybin, the active ingredient in psychedelic mushrooms, was 80% after six months, which is fucking huge. And that's like single doses of psilocybin. Um, maybe it was a three dose, but it was like minimal doses done done i'm done smoking 80 percent of the 80 percent of the people and you don't have any of these side effects and you don't have a drug that's constantly altering your neurochemistry so you know lizzie will drop that um drop that link in there as well but there's other stuff you know it's not just these psychedelic medicines which you know we'll continue to talk about a lot um there's a study showing that cbd can be a powerful antipsychotic treatment and we'll drop that study in there cbd is obviously one of the psychoactive components of marijuana um and that's showing reduction of psychotic symptoms. And yeah, it's not a big study, but there's really good indication of that. And then uh, Rogan actually tweeted this out recently. He said that the ketogenic diet as a treatment um, was shown in some cases by a Harvard psychiatrist to be superior to antipsychotic med medication. So fuck, maybe it's not even, maybe it's not even, you know, entirely these drugs. Maybe it's, you know, that, that drug that we all reach for and we've all been trained to reach for especially in someone in his generation which is sugar you know i mean that's shown to be one of the one of the most compelling substances that we can put in our body i mean once you're once you're used to ingesting sugar it's really hard to quit and it has some negative effects and perhaps the ketogenic diet or a low carb diet can start to reduce that i mean you look at pictures of the guy certainly doesn't look like he was a a, a picture of health you know, and, you know, I think you got to look at the vessel of the body. Like if the body is supported and strong and healthy, you know, that becomes like a resource of strength and hope and, you know, freedom from pain. You know, when you feel really good in your body, then you're way less likely to lash out. You know, you're way less likely to take that and, and do something horrific because you feel good internally. And so I think we got to really look at the body health of all these individuals too. Like how frequently was he exercising? Was he, you know, 
what was his diet like? Like these are fucking factors that I think, you know, we can all take a look at and, um, and just consider, you know, consider that, especially with the research that's coming out. And then again, you know, as I said, we're going to be talking a lot more about um, psychedelics. And there's two studies that I'd like to point to showing that psychedelics not only are treating these primary conditions, um, but they're also having ancillary benefits. Like there's a study that was post, posted in Science Daily that psychedelics actually reduce domestic violence rates. So dropping the urge to commit violence against people you love. Now, again, that's slightly different, maybe anger-based or something else, but another, another statistic in reducing violence. And then another study um, published in the UK says that psychedelics reduce suicide risk. So you got to look at these. And, you know, you know, I think right now is a, a good time to mention that if you haven't probably guessed, the charity campaign that, um, that I've created was actually in process creating was to support maps.org and Hefter, who are the leading two nonprofit organizations that are advancing the field of psychedelic medicine. So maps is working with MDMA assisted psychotherapy and Hefter is working and USONA are working on uh, psilocybin treatment for depression and anxiety. And we're really close to getting those approved and it's just going to take a little bit of funding to get those across. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the effects of that. You know, I was talking to my good friend, Dr. Dan Engel, who worked in a clinical psychiatric ward. And we were talking about the link between internal pain and the urge to violence. And he said it was beyond conclusive. He said that everyone that he encountered that had some kind of homicidal tendency had experienced either deep pain or deep trauma. You know, that is one of the things that breaks the human operating system. When you have pain that you're reliving every single day, you know, every moment of the day, you know, all of a sudden the world changes the way it looks. The world is a painful place. Your life is painful. You know, life itself is painful. Life itself is painful for everyone if you have that paradigm. If you say, my life hurts so bad, life hurts for everybody, then what is the cost of taking the lives of others? You know, you're unable to, you're unable to see anything beyond your own pain and your own trauma. So we got to look at that, you know, like what was this, what was this individual's childhood trauma? What happened? Was he molested? Was he, was he abused? Was what, what happened that broke this operating system? You know, again, it could be something else could be, you know, some concussions or some weird hereditary disease that the mental health system could check. It could be multiple of these factors. We don't know, but I'm just trying to like canvas the whole, the whole category. And, you know, according to, you know, Dr. Engel, which also Dr. Gabor Mate and a lot of the leading experts are talking about, you got to look at the sources of pain and how to heal them. The problem is, is that we're dog shit at treating both physical pain and emotional psychological pain in our current paradigm. And that's something that we absolutely have to change. So let's talk about physical pain. You know, I think we're in an absolute epidemic of opioid addiction right now. I mean, people are using this not only to escape their physical pain, but using it to escape their mental pain as well. And I think, again, you can point to CBD, which shows, uh, I have two, two studies here. One is a survey of 100 consecutive patients published in the Hawaii Journal of Medicine that showed a 64% reduction in chronic pain with CBD. And then there's um, other meta-analysis of multiple double-blind clinical trials that show that marijuana and CBD can reduce chronic pain. Uh, Kratom is another one, another herb that's able to, uh, to help reduce that. There's other options. And fuck, you know, look at exercise, look at sex. Like all of those things can help reduce chronic pain, but those are not the things that are being discussed. What's being, you know, what's being given out in the doctor's office are typically opioid um, pain pills and it's not working. People are getting hooked and it's not actually dealing with the pain. You know, we had a friend and he was actually, um, he was actually a, one of the early members at the Onnit gym, a fucking stud. He, I remember we did this this challenge, this test where you throw a, a medicine ball over your head and you see how far you can go. And um, that really adapts well to my strength system, my power system. So, you know, I was one of the gym leaders in that. And he fucking threw it like 12 feet farther than me. I mean, he was a savage. And, and then, you know, fast forward two years, you know, he called a few times, myself and Whitney, and, you know, he was struggling. And I tried to point him to some aboga treatment centers to get over his addiction to pain pills. And then we heard a call, you know, maybe six, eight months after the last time we talked to him and he'd, uh, he'd overdosed and killed himself. 
And so there's a problem. You know, there's a problem and we got to address it and we got to look at it from different ways because the current paradigm is not is not working. So let's talk about, um, oh, and here's another really, really important study here. So that's physical pain. So then let's talk about emotional pain. Um, so one real area of emotional pain is that feeling of being outcast and rejected by society. You know, in tribal times, if you were outcast or rejected by your tribe, that meant death. You know, human beings needed their tribe to survive. You know, if you were exiled from your people, see ya, the wolves got you. You know, unless you were one of those random outliers that could carve out an existence with a spear against the harshness of nature, and, you know, most people couldn't. So that was death. So the pain of that is, is severe. It's intense because it's designed to drive us towards community and drive us towards, you know, that common bond, that tribe. So when you get feel like you're rejected and you're alone, you know, that's... A terrifying place to be it's an incredibly painful so a swiss group did a study where they studied uh, mdma and psilocybin for social rejection and it was really interesting both mdma and psilocybin um, which are the two compounds that are getting put forward in uh, by maps and hefter respectively um, both showed benefit but in this particular case um, the mdma uh, for a moment of levity actually showed benefit because um, people misunderstood their rejection they didn't feel rejected at all they were kind of they were playing this game called powerball where people were they had a bunch of researchers as plants and everybody was passing the ball back to each other and to make them feel socially rejected they wouldn't pass the ball to this one person so it's like that kind of getting picked last on the playground to the extreme and they just kept this study going and then they measured the the psychological distress and with mdma people actually thought that they were getting past the ball more often so it worked, but it didn't work in the, in the right way. But with actually with the psilocybin, they were able to actually analyze and review uh, what was happening and look at it from a completely different perspective and not feel the pain that comes from that social rejection. So psilocybin certainly seems to be the medicine that would be most effective in helping to turn around this kind of social rejection. Um, and then, you know, in addition, in addition, the uh, the phase two trials that have been conducted by Hefter, um, I think it's like over 100 patients, and these are patients with cancer who are suffering from depression and anxiety, um, showed that 80 percent, over 80 percent of people who were treated um, with a single dose, were able to cure their depression and anxiety in people who were mortally and morbidly uh, ill with cancer. So that's the phase two trial that. Um, now USONA is going to take over and um, you know bring through phase three and offer as a treatment but as soon see the beauty of this as soon as these medicines get scheduled differently so that doctors can prescribe it then off-label use becomes available so doctors would be able to prescribe this for someone who's feeling social rejection based upon even early clinical studies so it's a race to get these things over the finish line and rescheduled from schedule one so that doctors can actually prescribe them. We're not talking about legalization here. We're just talking about the ability for trained clinicians to be able to use this in cases where they need it. I mean, because right now their hands are tied. I've talked to so many of these psychiatrists and psychologists, and they're like, look, I can talk to somebody for three years, or I can bring them in a psychedelic session for three hours. And those, those three hours are going to be far more persuasive than three years of talk therapy. And that's showing up over and over. And over the next month, I'm going to have a bunch of podcasts that are talking with some of these primary um, facilitators that were involved in this: Anthony Bosis, Michael and Annie Midhofer. Um, we're going to have these. We're going to have these launch. So, if anybody's interested, this whole month we're going to be really talking about this issue, and I was planning on talking about it anyways, um, because it's not just about, you know, it's not just about these active shooters. It just happened that this came up, and this is something that is worth addressing because it's so horrifying and so present but you know how many people are suffering from depression and anxiety and social rejection and addiction i mean this this extends so far beyond this this case um so for anybody who's curious at this point to take a look at the campaign uh the campaign is called the cure is near and um the cure is near.com should redirect to my crowdrise page which is crowdrise.com slash the cure is near um you know, I've seeded the funding and for anybody who's interested in donating, you know, how it's going to go is um, 
50% is going to go to MAPS, 25% to Hefter to study the newer clinical indications of psilocybin, and then 25% to USONA to bring across uh, the phase three trials of psilocybin. Um, but I'm about to talk a little bit more about the MAPS trial because you know one of these main sources of pain is trauma. So currently, in the case of PTSD and trauma, there's really nothing that's working. You know, I mean, the standard of care is like a cocktail of different uh, different pharmaceuticals that I've talked to a bunch of people in active military, veterans, you know, first responders, you know, rape victims, anybody who's carrying a lot of trauma. They have what's called they have like a trauma score. And that score goes from like zero to a hundred. And you know, discussing with one of the um, with one of the clinicians, he's saying like what we're seeing is like an average reduction of maybe ten points from like sixty to fifty at the best case standard of care. Well, Maps took those people who were treatment resistant, so the people who weren't seeing any benefit from the current pharmaceuticals, and they conducted phase two trials. And in those phase two trials, sixty one percent of the hundred and seven participants no longer qualified for PTSD after two months after they underwent three sessions of MDMA-assisted psychotherapy. So this is important to note. For one, there was three sessions where they took MDMA with a, with a certified and trained clinician. And then, boom, instead of those scores in 60, they're getting scores reduced below the clinical threshold, which I'm not sure what that number is, somewhere like 10, 12, something, like a complete reduction. So they're not even, no longer even qualified for trauma. That's a cure. You know, we've gone from the paradigm of treatment to the paradigm of cure with this compound and it's something that they don't need to continue taking because one in a one year follow up the 61% that no longer qualified grew to 68%. So not only were people, you know, getting better when they got treatment, they were getting better over time, which means it triggered the body to start being able to heal itself. And that is really remarkable because that's what we need to do. The body is miraculous. We just need to give it some help and give it some support. So that it can do what it's naturally able to do and look i've watched you know i've watched the maps protocol not conducted by maps but conducted by other um you know kind of underground clinicians i've watched it deal with trauma i've watched you know stories of abuse and and things that were hidden in people's psyche i've, I've watched that come out in a space of love and a space of understanding and a space of reevaluation of of the event and it's incredibly beautiful and it, it shows just what this is capable of and and talking to some of the clinicians you know mdma fosters this sense of love and security and well-being and safety and it allows the brain to access these inc normally incredibly painful memories and when it accesses these it's actually able to release and run the program to be able to to look at those and repattern those memories with the current emotional state like the emotions are what translates the truth to the body and by repatterning it with a different emotional state the emotional state of that openness and love and safety and security they're actually repatterning the memory itself and that's um that's incredibly incredibly powerful and beautiful to witness and that's one of the potential mechanisms of action that um that's at play here so again i mean really unbelievable um unbelievable and the participants the participants on average had suffered from PTSD for 17.8 years and all of a sudden they're cured. Three sessions. And that's one of the reasons why just recently, even you know, as I was building this campaign, just recently the FDA um, granted MAPS breakthrough drug status, which it almost never does. And super credit to the FDA. I think you can give the FDA a lot of shit and you know, maybe in certain cases they deserved it, but they looked at this data and they didn't try to squash it. You know, there wasn't any conspiracy there where they're saying, oh no, we got to bury this, you know, and like big bad FDA. No, they followed the data and that's what they should have done. And by following the data, they gave it breakthrough drug status. And what breakthrough drug status means, it's going to get preferential treatment as it goes through the system so that it can reach the market faster. They identified that, you know, there's estimates of up to 40 veterans committing suicide a day. You, know, you look at some of these tragedies that are that are happening right now. You know this thing in Las Vegas. That's horrifying. That's almost sixty people who were killed. But you're talking about veterans who are killing themselves at up to forty people a day. You know we're having mass killing on a daily basis, and there's just no hope to address it. And there's so people don't talk about it. 
and that's just in veterans you know and let alone the people who are carrying this trauma and then passing this trauma to their families and then passing this trauma to their children and you know these lines of multi-generational trauma that are being created that can be you know released in at least two out of every three which is fucking huge you know so and that's again to the fda's credit why they gave it breakthrough drug status but in order to get the phase three trials funded maps who's a nonprofit organization you know any any big pharma who has breakthrough drug status they got all the money in the world they could ipo more shares they could raise a fucking billion dollars but since maps has no profit attached to the creation of this they can't raise money in the public market they're a nonprofit. they have to raise money through donations and right now they've raised like 19 of the 25 million necessary for these phase three trials and if the phase three trials look like the phase two then this treatment is going to be legal but they can't start until they raise that 21 25 million so they're like six million away and every day that goes by that they don't raise that money people die <laughs> like and it's just fucked up that there's so much fucking money in the world and it's just being given to such random things you know when this can affect the most lives <laughs> and it's not that much money and um, and we can do it. Like, that's not unachievable. It's $6 million. Like, we can do it. We can get it across the line. I don't think there's ever been a time in history where so little was needed to do so much. You know, like, we're right at the tipping point. So again, if you're interested in the campaign and, and researching all this and looking at it, um, you know, leave a comment. We'll send you the link, um, and and you know, support anything. Anything helps. And uh, as I said, if you want to donate um, a larger amount, then you can reach out to my email, hello at Aubrey Marcus, and I'll connect you with the Maps people and and link you up directly. Um, because CrowdRise will take a small fee. But it's a lot easier to batch and process like micro donations than going directly. Uh, so if you're you know going to donate a couple hundred dollars or a thousand dollars, just use the CrowdRise. If not, if you want to donate more, five, ten, whatever, um, you know, then then reach out and we'll help link you up with uh, with Maps directly. Or if particularly you just want to donate to Maps or just want to donate to Hefter, then um, you know then you can reach out uh, to them directly. Um, and again, for those, you know, listening on the podcast, uh, the cure is near.com, uh, crowdrise.com slash the cure is near. And, um, you'll be able to see that there. All right. The other thing is again, addiction and drug abuse, um, you know, addiction to methamphetamines, you know, is linked to violence and drug use of, of the negative kind is of course linked to that. And we've talked about addiction with smoking. But there's addiction treatments available in all kinds of psychedelic medicines, from psilocybin to aboga. Even ayahuasca has some good research for some people looking at some of those earlier stage indications for addiction. Um, you know, check out the work of Dr. Gabor Mate. I released a podcast with him, and he was talking about trauma and the release of addiction. He's using uh, psychedelic medicines to treat people in Vancouver, which is um, one of the hubs of heroin addiction. Um, but there's a lot of different outlets that are available and i think obviously you got to take a look at you know not only what prescriptions this guy was on but what other drugs he was taking because that's certainly an issue and then just kind of reevaluating the whole drug addict kind of look i think with the dare campaign and everything in the 80s everybody started looking at drug users as criminals drug u drug users are in pain you know i think it was gabor mate who said that um not all trauma creates addiction but all addicts carry trauma you know, and their addiction is actually them reaching for a cure for their trauma. You know, that's the basis of their addiction. And, and I think we've, we don't look at it like that. We look at them like they're just lustful, greedy people who just want to, they're just hedonists that are, you know, taking advantage of the system or we kind of judge them as differently rather than seeing them as this is someone who's trying to escape from trauma. Like we don't need to throw them in a box and behind bars and dehumanize them more like that's insane you know i think we're going to look at the current way that we handled you know drug users and drug addicts 
as just a travesty. You know, we'll look at it as we look at issues with race and fucking women's right to vote. We'll be like, what the fuck were we thinking? You know, I mean, it's it's really tragic the way that we look at at drug use in, in our society and creating conscious systems that can help people get well rather than just punishing them and dehumanizing them further. So that's an area that we really got to look for legal reform and also just social understanding reform. You know, when you catch people, you know, fortunately in the movies, you know, I think for a while there, like every bad guy was just a drug dealer. Like that was like, and like every bad other bad guy was like a drug user, you know, and I think now that's shifted a little bit and there's other villains out there. And, but it, I think just releasing the stigma of this and realizing this is largely just people who are looking to escape from their own pain, you know, and, and really, finding the human element of that is really important as we look forward. All right, so those are a lot of the underlying causes of this pain and trauma that I think, you know, we can actionably do something else to, um, to correct. Um, all right, the second major thing, community. You know, where was this guy's support system? Who was there to check on him as he was stockpiling his guns and explosives? Like, where was his tribe, where was his, you know, his community that could just say like, hey man, you all right? Like, what's going on? And I think that's what we're missing. It's all too easy to be completely isolated, to have only digital interactions, you know, maybe a phone call here or there. You know, you can almost go, apparently he was a gambler, you could go in, show up, hardly talk to anybody, even participate in casino floor, but nobody's really checking in on him. It's like we're surrounded by people, but we're not connected to any of them. We've lost the ritual, we've watched the, the bonding between people. We've lost the, the compassion to really care and reach out for our fellow man. And I think that's a major issue. I mean, if this guy was part of a community and part of a tribe, this would have been prevented. They would have checked up on him. They would have been like, hey, what's going on? Where is this going? And then if need be, you know, gotten some professional help. But he didn't have that, obviously. You know, and that's the case with a lot of these individuals who are stockpiling the stuff and planning it. You know, the seeds of this were sown way earlier, and community is that good reflection point, that check and balance. And I've had that happen with people in, in my community as well, people who've kind of lost their way, and everybody kind of rallies around them and gets some support and, you know, points them in the right direction. And, yeah, sometimes it is pharmaceutical intervention. Pharmaceuticals aren't all evil. Like, they can be helpful, and sometimes it is, you know, a combination of different therapies that are available. But, but at least, like keeping that thread of support and keeping that, you know, checking in on somebody, I think it's incredibly important and it's something that we've lost. And as the years go, you know, I'm, I'm already, you know, in my mind trying to figure out how we adapt tribal living to a modern society because we're not all going to be able to live in compounds. We're going to have to leverage the communication points that we have. We're going to have to leverage the rituals that we have available and actually create something that works with modern society. And I think that's possible, you know, and I'm, trying to blueprint that myself for my own life because I know I want it I want that kind of community in my own life and I think it can be incredibly valuable so um, a lot of times we talk about community again but we lack the actionable steps so you know I'll be working on the actionable steps and I'm sure you know on my podcasts and posts I'll be sharing how that goes because I think that's a really important part of this and then you know kind of connected all this but you know right now with the current drug legislation and the current information that's out there in society, there aren't legitimate ways to find those paradigm altering direct spiritual experiences. You know, this is uh, the subject of a book um, called Stealing Fire by Jamie Wheel and Stephen Kotler. And it talks about, they call it ex ecstasis or ecstasy. And it's these higher states of consciousness where you connect to direct metaphysical truth and metaphysical truth, like the truth that we're all the same person living a different life, which breeds the compassion, which prevents you from wanting to hurt anybody because you're realizing you can't hurt anybody without hurting yourself. You know, ultimately, we're all connected. And, you know, but right now, that's not pervasive information. You know, unfortunately, religion all too often has gotten lost in its religiosity and lost the direct spiritual connection. Not saying that's the case entirely across the board, but certainly you know, a lot of the rituals are, are empty. You know, I don't think people who are um, typically taking the sacrament are really feeling the sacrament, you know, in, in our society. But there's ways to take a sacrament and feel the sacrament, and that's been a big 
path in my life, but it's not just the plants. You know, it's shamanic breathing, it's yoga, it's ecstatic dance, it's flotation tanks, it's all of the different ways to connect to the higher parts of yourself and the higher parts of the collective. But that's not pervasive, you know. I mean, unless you're really looking for it, you're not going to find it. You may drive by a yoga studio just like you may drive by a Baptist church and you may not think twice about it, you know. Um, And I think really helping these kind of transformational festivals not just happen on festival grounds like Burning Man, but bring them into the cities, bring these options available and start having education and really conscious thought around it. I mean, you can look at the research on mindfulness. You can look at the research on yoga. You can look at the research on all these things. This shit works, like period. It just works. And all of these things can start to correct these kind of um, negative thought patterns that make you really solipsistic, that make you look inside and kind of prevent you from releasing your pain and connecting to those those deeper truths and that feeling of love and connection that's available in the universe. You know, but it's also hard too, especially now at this time, I think things are going to become exacerbated because if you're not paying attention to that, you know, kind of underground movement of consciousness, which is becoming mainstream, you look around and the world looks like a shit show. I mean, it just looks like everybody's in conflict. Everybody's thinking about themselves. Everybody's focused on their own pain. Everybody's in pain. You know, nobody is really exemplifying these metaphysical truths. If you just look blindly at at what the news is providing and look around and see what's being shown to us until you actually get actually into the into the subculture and really see what's happening underneath but that subculture needs to become the culture and that's a major major part of you know the direction that we need to push if we're going to really correct some of these serious serious issues and then finally you know right now is is going to be an interesting time. I talked about it on my last podcast with Jamie that, you know, at a certain point, we're going to have to face the consequences of our collective momentum. You know, all of these choices that we've done with, um, you know, the scheduling of the drugs, all the prohibition of the treatments, all of the, you know, the ways that the media has manipulated us, all the ways that politicians have divided us for years, like all of these things, eventually we have to confront that momentum. And it appears that we're confronting that now. And this is a storm. It's a storm that's happening externally and a storm that's happening internally. And the only way that we're going to get through it is to start doing the work internally as well as providing help. And so, you know, that's a big part of what my platform has been about, you know, shore up the body, make sure that the body is a source of strength, not a source of pain. You know, that's what the on it movement really stands for. A lot of my mindset practices that I'm constantly talking about that's getting the psyche and the emotional body in a state of um, wholeness in a state of at least the ability to explore and and deal with some of the challenging issues that you have so and then of course find ways to connect um, through ritual to those or practice through those deeper spiritual experiences we have to do that work ourselves you know there's a reason they say put your oxygen mask on before assisting others like to be fit for to be of service, you have to be fit for service, you know, and that's really crucial. So, in addition, you know, I hope some of you are able to donate um, to the campaign. Uh, again, that's you know, the cure is near um, campaign on CrowdRise. And if you're not able to, though, just you know, do it, do it for yourself. Take care of yourself, for yourself, for your family, for those around you. You know, share it and and share that love and, and do your best to see people you know, as, as their best self. And I think that's another way that you can really heal. You know, every time everybody is a mirror for ourselves. Like if we, if we think of ourselves as a force, everybody is a mirror that receives that force. And, but the mirror has an option about what it reflects back. If we just reflect back to people, their ugliness, their divisions, their pain, then that's all they'll see. All they'll see is their own ugliness, their division, their pain. But if we reflect back to them and show them that we see we see their divinity, we see their their hope, we see their fight, we see all of their good qualities, as well as their bad, you know, not being blind to the bad, but we see their true essence of, of who they are, then they will see that too, because they'll be looking at us as that mirror. And I think there was something that, uh, you know, I learned on Duncan Trussell's podcast with Paul Selig, which was kind of mind blowing, but, um, you know, he, he repeated these things. He said, I see, I see who you are in truth 
I see what you are in truth. I see how you serve in truth. You are free. You are free. You are free. And he's, he used that as like a, as like a reset. And I think whenever we see somebody who's acting in a way that's, you know, triggers our judgment and triggers some of this, like try to see them as the hurt, scared little boy or girl that's just trying to, you know, find love and trying to find their way and don't focus solely on the pain and the expression of that pain and the tantrum. It's like a child when, when a child falls and skins their knee and they look up to their parents, if their parents make a big deal, oh my God, oh my God, let's take you to the emergency room immediately. That child's going to wail and scream and they're going to look at the parent to see that reflection back to the pain. But if they skin their knee and they, you know, lash out and they do something bad and the parent goes, yeah, it's all right, buddy, you're going to be fine and sees them as whole and as healthy, that kid will see themselves as whole and healthy and the crying will stop. You know, that's also part of this path. The part of this path is to treat others not for their pain. So when someone's flaming you online or someone's triggering you, you know, you don't have to engage with the trigger. You don't have to engage with that part of them. You can just engage with who they really are. I see who you are in truth. I see what you are in truth. I see how you serve in truth. You know, I see you on that consciousness level. I see what you're doing is just reaching out for pain, in pain. And um, so there's, you know, a lot of things that we can do and uh, a lot of things that that we will do. And I think ultimately um, the storm is coming. We are going to have to face the consequences of our collective actions. But if we embrace it the right way, it'll be a stronger, better world for it. Um, And the work starts the work starts inside. All right. Um, again, anybody leaving comments or questions, um, you know, we'll get back to you with the link. And uh, and right now, I'm just here to answer any questions or any comments that you have. So, Lizzie, Caitlin, if you guys want to take turns and um, comment on uh, any questions that have come up. Other than showing people their truth and showing love to other people. What else can people do in reaction to this tragic event? You know, I I think like we did at the start, it's an opportunity to practice compassion and it's an opportunity to practice and pattern action. You know, I think there's a there's a term that psychologists use. It's called narcotizing dysfunction. It's where you look at the news and you just watch the news over and over and over again until it actually tricks your brain into thinking that you're doing something about it when really you're just watching the news over and over and over again and you're not doing shit. So the term is called narcotizing dysfunction. And I think that's something that we have to be wary of. Like we have to uh, make sure that we're not only feeling this, but that we're actually doing something about it. You know, either that's working on ourselves or helping others or, um, you know, uh, doing something along those lines. And I, I see the comments here that it's hard to, hard to hear you. And so I'll repeat the, I'll repeat the question for everybody when, uh, when you ask it. But yeah, I, I think, making sure that we're translating the compassion we feel into action and not getting caught up just watching the news cycle until it feels like it's over because we got to take action. Now is the time to let our voices be heard. A lot of people are saying this stuff arises in childhood. What do you think we can do for our children to start taking preventative steps? I think, um, you know, I'm not a parent, but I've been around a lot of great parents and I've been around uh, a lot of bad parents. And, um, I think one of the things is, is that parents feel this need to be parental with their, with their kids. And it's always this kind of antagonistic authority relationship where nobody really feels comfortable actually talking to the parents. Because if every time you talk to them about what's going on, you get a negative reaction, either annoyance or punishment, or if something happens, then you're going to create a relationship where, you know, you're like the cop trying to give out speeding tickets you know, and the kid's going to put on their fucking radar detector and, you know, they're going to fly under the radar and not come to you for help. So make sure that, you know, your reactions are not deepening the trauma in your, in your kids. You know, I mean, obviously, you know, there, you have to set the boundaries. I understand that, but you can still set boundaries with love. You don't need to set boundaries with trauma and boundaries with anger. And you got to create that, that synergistic relationship. Like you're all in this together. And that parents, and you got to admit when you're wrong too, because if you're the type of parent that says, do this because I said so, and I'm always right, you know, kids are going to be like, you're a fucking idiot. And then, you know, you're going to lose the ability to actually be a proper guide. 
and then also watch out you know like watch out for your kids like there's predators out there and it's not that you know there's things that happen to your kids when you're not looking and you have to really tap in and like really be in tune with your kids emotional state and the emotional state of others to to know i'm not talking about like being a hypochondriac like never bring them around strangers but like be aware you have to recognize that you don't always know what's happening and you don't always know what's there and you don't always know and you just have to tap in and and see what's going on um and and that's and that's a real key thing that that all parents can do and um yeah i mean that's uh, i think something to pay attention to so be an ally for your kids be there be aware and you know help them through whatever happens and people will make mistakes and you know you move forward with love and and try to uh try to address it people are asking for alternatives besides just plant medicine meditation and yoga they want to know if there are other treatments well i think really the key is to find something that gets you out of your current thought patterns and your current way of thinking about things um, and I think any type of flow state, anything that you're really enjoying, I mean, I know basketball for me was an outlet because so when I was playing basketball and I was dribbling the ball and shooting hoops and, um, and doing whatever I could, then that was, you know, that was something that I could turn to, to escape from my own shit, get out of my head and, and be a part of something that, um, that was part of the healing cascade rather than the pain cascade. And, uh, and that was really important for me as I was growing up. I mean, that was crucial. So I think finding things that you love in general, whether it's surfing or whether it's, you know, playing or whatever you want to do, um, you know, that's, that's an absolute, that's an absolute key. And, uh, and I think the other practices are maybe even stronger, but at the very least find something that you can fully get involved in. Maybe it's your art, maybe it's journaling, you know, journaling and art and, you know, spending time with people who make you feel more whole and make you feel more love, you know, that's, that's going to, that's going to be, um, absolutely crucial. We were asked how we create a real media. So I'm going to kind of shift and say the media is divisive and inflammatory. So how can people navigate that better? I think you just have to have awareness. I think, uh, surrounding the media and how to deal with the media. Um, I think you just have to have awareness of what the media is going to show and the motives for that. You have to understand that all media is looking to get people to follow it, looking to get people to pay attention. And, um, and in that case, um, you have to realize that it's going to be inflammatory. It wants narcotizing dysfunction. It wants you to just sit there and watch all day and absorb all that content. Like that is the primary goal of the media. And so with that awareness, take the facts for what they are, what you can see, but don't get caught up in that. You know, try to find alternative news sources, potentially like Vice News or you know, some other reports, but, but just be aware of what's being presented to you and be aware of the motives behind what's being presented to you as you're looking at the media. People are looking for guidance on how to react to those that are defending guns after this tragedy. Guns. It was inevitable that we cover this issue. Um, and the, uh, I think, you know, I might as well just dive in with my thoughts. Guns are an attachment that Americans have. And whenever you release an attachment, it's going to be extra incredibly traumatic. I think people oversimplify the solution. Oh, just get rid of the guns. I think people oversimplify how divisive and how dangerous of a move that will be to forcibly take someone's, what they're attached to as their security from them. And I think if that move is made, and I'm not saying, I'm not trying to cast my lot one way or the other, I'm saying that you can't overlook what that reaction will be. I mean, that reaction could be everything from a full-blown civil war, you know, which many, many more lives will be lost, to maybe it does go kind of smooth. But it's a very sensitive topic that's very deeply engendered and very deeply, uh, people are deeply committed to as far as guns are concerned. And, you know, I, I really want to focus on, like, what's the root cause of this pain and trauma that's causing this? You know, we saw in France that someone took a truck and drove it through a crowded area and killed dozens of people, you know, with a truck, like agreed, you know, weapons that have been 
made automatic, it certainly makes that impulse to violence more dramatic. Like there's no question about that. And, you know, but is that a solution that's going to cause more harm or more good? And that's a real, a real question. This isn't some kind of platonic ideal where we can just imagine that all guns magically evaporate through a magic wand if the magic fairy comes and says gun control is in like we can't expect that um but then again you know i think taking a look at this with just a real conscious and and an understanding that the people who are defending their guns like you got to look at them for the human side of that too you got to look at them and say like this is something that's part of their identity it's part of their security you can't just tell them to give that up without really examining this process. So I think it's important to important to um, to look at this and from all different angles. And uh, and I think that's in the, that's the angle that I think a lot of people are missing. They're just kind of imagining this magical solution when it's certainly not a magical solution. We have to deal with the momentum of what's happened and the attachments that actually exist, and then look at it pragmatically. From what's the effect on the degradation of society if we do make that move again i'm not casting my lot either way i own guns you know um and you know i feel comfortable owning guns um but you know if there was a world where there were no guns you know i could be fine in that world too you know it's just um it's a very complicated issue and it's not as easy as everybody thinks so i think really the most important thing that we can all do and all agree on is finding the sources that can help you know, treat and cure the trauma that's causing the urge to violence. Someone wrote in and asked, why not take sh natural shrooms instead of synthetic MDMA, for example? What's your advice to people who are resistant to quote unquote man-made versus natural? Well, I think actually the psilocybin that's used and synthesized in the trials might even be synthetic psilocybin. You know, I, I think um, I do love the plants and I think there's a lot of value in the plants. Um, but nonetheless, I think the compounds themselves have inherent value. I mean, some of the extracts like psilocybin, we wouldn't know about it if the mushrooms didn't bring that to our awareness. Um, so, you know, using just the psilocybin, like they're not actually having people eat mushroom because there's a lot of stuff with the stalk and stem that comes along with it that can be difficult for digestion, et cetera. So they're really going to the compound. And I think that's OK. I think we can get biased towards the plants in some cases. In a lot of cases, that's the safest bet. Um, but in these cases, these compounds have medicinal value, like undoubtedly. So, you know, I think that's important to take a look at. Well, everybody, I love you guys and I, and I love our world. I love our society and I, I know that it's worth saving. I know that it's worth fighting for. And, um, you know, we'll, uh, we'll move forward and we'll, We'll do something about it. And that's the beauty of this is, um, you know, I know a lot of you listening are with me and uh, I feel the support constantly and I feel the community growing and I feel that's what gives me hope, you know, seeing you guys and seeing your reactions and seeing your comments and seeing your love and, and just knowing that, you know, love exists, love is real and it can heal all of this with the right intention, with the right consciousness, with the right compassion. And, um, you know, go out and hug somebody today. You know, give them some love and uh, that'll be the first step. And, and again, you know, for anybody listening, I hope you do check out the Cure is Near campaign. I think it is a great step and I think we are really close. So um, and, you know, I'm honored to play my part and I'll stay with you guys the rest of this month. And we'll talk about this in a bunch of different venues. I'll jump on Instagram and talk about it. I'll jump on podcasts and talk about it. And and uh, let's start making some change. Let's stop talking about it and be about it, you know, to a certain degree. And I think it's, it's time for that. It's time for action. So I love you guys. Thank you so much for tuning in. That's it for now. Bye.